So my name is Holmir Dvorovsky, and I come from uh, Wrocław, which is a city in southern Poland. And currently, I'm working at Nokia, where we are moving uh, base station software to the cloud, hence the name of Has the name of uh, my team, Natasha Pirinov, which directly translates to lighting throwers. Okay, in this presentation, I'd like to uh, show you compilers from different perspectives, and I have only 15 minutes, so I'm not going to go into details. Let's start with an overview. How do we perceive compilers? Well, most of the time, we get something like this in our minds. There is a compiler, we feed the compiler with C++ input, and we get some binary, presumably x86. And it's perfectly valid. I mean, it's OK. But if we make a simple step towards the reality, this picture will be more accurate. Besides, C and C++ compilers do support other languages, like, for instance, Google Go. And as far as I know, GCC comes with support for nine languages. And of course, you can plug in your own front end. And on the other hand, not only x86 is supported by compilers, but also other architectures. And it's kind of insane, but GCC supports more than 60 uh, forget architectures, which is amazing. And of course, you still can have your custom targets. And one of cool examples of such uh, a compiler is Chirp, which is a modified clunk which allows you to write web applications, isomorphic web applications in C++. So instead of producing binary, it produced JavaScript. Interesting, isn't it? OK, how it is even possible? It's all possible due to the architecture of compilers, which, which is quite modular. Uh, we have clear split between the front end and the back end. And uh, the main responsibility of the front end is to convert input file into internal representation of the compiler. And this internal representation is something like interface between those two. And the backend then will optimize the code, generate, and optimize it further. So if you want to support another language, you just unplug this front end and plug in your own, and you're done. And the important thing is that most of the things that are happening in the, in the compilers are being done in the backend. So front end is just support for single language. And all of the optimizations happen uh, in the backend. And this is huge. Compilers are huge. So the question is you now, how can we customize the, uh, the behavior? So when we are learning how to program in C++, we are simultaneously learning how to use compilers. We start with most basic options. Then we discover how to produce libraries like shared and static ones, then uh, how to control warnings, how to optimize, and eventually we become ninjas, so we know how to detach preprocessor or standard library. And I made a little research about how customizable GCC is when compared to other tools. And well, those here I have uh, standard Linux tools like find or grab, and there's a huge gap when it comes to number of, of uh, command line switches. So I, I know, I know that it's, it isn't perfect measure, but it tells us something, that we are dealing with something big which is highly customizable. OK, so now let's move on with the standard. So once again, when we look from the top level, it's easy. We ha it's oversimplified, but we have one international standard. And this standard is, this specification is being implemented by different vendors. Uh, so in result, we have different compilers. But we must keep in mind that this is C++. And things are not easy by definition. So if you look into the standard for implementation defined stuff, <coughs> you're going to find more than 100 of items. And there is one more thing which is more evil. You name it. Undefined. Exactly, undefined behavior. So I looked for in the standard for uh, it's undefined phrase, and I have found more than 100, uh, 100 uh, occurrences. So even if you are experienced programmers, we still can introduce bugs to, to, to the application uh, without even noticing. 
So programming in C++ is like going to the dark cave without flashlight, knowing that it can be bitten by a snake. But recently, things started to change. Compilers are now, now um, like trying to help us to discover uh, possible failures. And one of the things that uh, was created is Amplifying Behavior Sanitizer, which helps us to, uh, it, it instruments the code and helps to, to see whether Amplifying Behavior happens in runtime. And with those tools, we are able to uh, have more control over what's, what's happening and we are able to detect uh, undefined behaviors on the fly. Okay, and most undefined behavior stuff, I, I believe actually everything related to undefined behaviors comes from the performance point of view. I mean, Sandbot wants to ensure that we will take everything from the metal. And the compilers also do. We have a lot of optimizations uh, taking place in, in comp uh, compilers uh, like uh, during the compilation, optim optimizations are everywhere, literally. So we start uh, during the AST and we go, even after the objects are created, we still uh, can optimize because some information is encoded into those objects. So the link time optimizer can kick in and optimize whole application. And even after binary is produced, we still can optimize it using, for instance, profile guided optimization, or I think that uh, was recently announced, announced uh, like a few days ago by uh, a couple of guys from Google, the efficiency sanitizer. I'm going to uh, talk about this in later slides. Okay, the second thing about the optimizing compilers is that people tend to underestimate what the compiler can do. Consider this simple example, I would say classical one. If you want to swap two variables. You can do this either this way or this way. This way is for hackers. They think that uh, free XOR instructions will be faster than having temporary value. But when you do measurements, you actually discover that this XOR hack is actually slower. Why? Do you know? Here we have data dependency, which can make it slower. And the thing is that a lot of knowledge about optimization were already put into the compilers, and the compilers know a lot about CPU caches, uh, CPU extensions, and also the thing is that some CPU, uh, CPUs are not perfect, right? So there might be some CPU performance bugs for some instructions, that's possible, and the compiler will know about it. What about us? Not necessarily. And the point here is that compiler will look at everything from different points of view and will create a code that it's, it's very hard for a human to actually write an application that will out, uh, outperform the application generated by, by a compiler. Okay, great. And the last thing that I'd like to, to uh, talk about is the ecosystem that has grown around the compilers. Uh, so, I already, already mentioned the undefined behavior sanitizer, but we have more sanitizers like address sanitizer or memory sanitizer. Those two help us to find problems related to memory, like memory leak or, uh, let's say, uh, reading initialized memory. Then, if our application is multi threaded, we can utilize thread sanitizer uh, to, to, to find deadlocks, data races, and so on. And we need to keep in mind that our application can be subject of hacking, literally. So one, one hacker can try to, to hijack the control flow of the application. And for, for this, we, can, we have control flow sanitizer, which will look for situations in which the hacker could possibly use, I don't know, techniques like return-oriented programming. And recently, a uh, couple of guys from Google announced that they started work on efficiency sanitizer, which is going to add instrumentalization that will help, help discover uh, situations like write after write, and will give a hint that, okay, this, maybe this is not needed, or they will uh, look for situations where reordering the fields within a structure can be better when it comes to cache friendliness. And this list is 
not complete, actually. It's, it's good to go to the documentation of your compiler is, and see uh, what's, what's supported. Also, the modern compilers are shipped with tools that help us to do other stuff, like Clang format to reformat the code, Clang tidy, which is a C++ linter, Clang complete, uh, which can be used by IDEs to provide suggestions to the user, and Clang analyzer is a static analysis tool, and this list is also not complete. However, the common part of those tools is that they are not parsing C++. They are using compiler as a library. So those tools will get all of the information about the code with 100% accuracy. Even if we use Boost MPL, the information will be 100 accu uh, accurate. That's, that's important. Okay, and Peter uh, mentioned Templator. And actually there is an alternative in, in, in Clunk called Template, uh, which does the same thing but is based on, on, on real Clunk. Uh, here we have uh, an example of uh, showing uh, template initialization instantiations like uh, like it was with cache brand. So it's funny because we, we've been having uh, runtime debuggers for years and no compile time debuggers. And a few weeks ago it was announced the, the synth tool which allows you to convert C++ code to HTML with uh, hyperlinks and the tool is simple, but it gets, again, all of the information from the compiler. So it knows where a std vector is type name, and this is a variable, and so on. It doesn't parse C++, and this is a, a big plus. Okay, great. And the last tool that I'd like to show you, I hope that such a tool will one day become part of some compiler, is a Stoke, which is stochastic optimizer for on, currently only for x86 machines. The idea is that you extract a small function from, from your, your code, from your binary, which is 10 instructions or something like this. And the, what the compiler does, it starts at some point and it does optimizations. So it's like moving a single point in multidimensional space in, in different places. So consider this is multidimensional space and the compiler will uh, work within some area where the program is valid. We'll try to find a uh, local minimum, right? But maybe there are some other areas where the program also is valid, but the compiler is not able to, to, to make a jump from this point to, to this point. So the key idea behind this stalk is to move in this uh, space, changing instructions, changing arguments, trying to find other places where the program is still valid and maybe uh, is better when it comes to performance. Okay, I think that's it. That's all I got for you. Thank you. If you have questions I can answer, but please keep in mind that my surname is Zborowski and not Karut, so. Any questions now? Please. Uh, sorry, can we get, uh, in the standard is written that. Uh, Yes, well, you can write your own. It's quite easy to, to, to write sanitizer, and we, uh, we, we see an explosion of sanitizers, like efficiency sanitizers, so maybe it will be like in next weeks we'll see something like this. But currently I have no idea whether such a thing exists. Uh, maybe I can comment on that. Mm -hmm. The noise diagnostic required is usually for errors that go beyond a single compilation unit, so the standard cannot uh, actually force the compiler yeah. to do diagnostic. But you, in most of the cases, maybe all, you 
you get a, a, a diagnostic from the linker that you probably will not link. Yeah, so, uh, I, I, I would like to see a tool that is independent. Uh, uh, and I, I don't just hope that I will get some uh, diagnostic, but I do get it. But for example, everything that's based on Clang still has a C plus compilation model with based on a single compilation unit and not a cross compilation unit yeah. used. So and that is my problem. <laughs> Are you pleased? Nice to know that, thank you. Any other questions? Okay.